Hello, and welcome to the first episode of Lesser Known Monsters. Now, I'm sure if you know anything about serial killers at all, you have some background knowledge on the more known psychopaths that have haunted, hunted, and killed in some of the most gruesome and disturbing ways imaginable. I'm talking about Ted Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer, Charles Manson and his family, John Wayne Gacy. But what about the not-so-famous killers who committed atrocities beyond comprehension, sometimes, in my own opinion, worse than the more famous ones I just listed? I'm talking about monsters like Bob Berdella, Dean Coral, and Andre Chikatilo. Each of these heinous killers have committed such mayhem on their own that I would dare say all three alone are more dangerous than, ten bu- than Ted Bundy and Jeffrey Dahmer put together. Their stories will terrify you to the core. The things these killers did will make you squirm in your seats, make you sick to your stomach. That is why I want to warn you this show is not for the easily frightened, squeamish, or anyone who can't handle stories about these gruesome crimes. Today we begin with a sexual sadist who, at a very early age, became obsessed with women's high-heeled shoes, stealing women's underwear, and eventually kidnapping, rape, and murder. This is the story of Jerome Jerry Brudos. Born on January 31, 1939, in Webster, South Dakota, Jerry was the youngest of two boys. This was a big problem for his mother, Eileen. She did not want any more children, and if it happened, she wanted a girl, not the freckled-faced, red-haired boy she ended up with. And she wasn't shy in showing her disappointment, either. At a very early age, as early as five years old, Jerry had already shown signs of disliking his mother. He was already calling her names like mean and stubborn and quickly grew to hate her. Jerry was neglected and his older brother was clearly the golden child. He was good at school, polite, and generally a good kid. Jerry, on the other hand, didn't really get the chance all kids deserve. At only five years old, Jerry was allowed to go out exploring by himself. I use the word allowed loosely here, as it was clearly neglect for the young boy. One of these expeditions brought Jerry to a landfill where he started looking around for hidden treasures and what he found was among the best treasure he had hoped to find. A pair of black high-heeled women's shoes. Jerry didn't hesitate to bring the shoes home and start wearing them around the house. Well, his mother Eileen happened to see him walking around in the shoes one day, and it did not go well. She berated the young boy and told him to immediately get rid of them. This confused Jerry at five years old. He didn't understand the big deal. He kept the shoes, hiding them, and parading around in them privately. A short time later, his mother found them again, this time taking them outside and setting them on fire, making young Jerry watch, the whole time telling him how evil he's acting and how bad what he had done was in her mind. Skip ahead a few years. Henry Brudos, Jerry's father, moved around a lot for work. Jerry seemed to get along with his father. To say the least, he liked him a lot more than he did his mother. Jerry's obsession with high-heeled shoes never went away. In fact, it slowly but surely got worse. While in elementary school, there was an incident where Jerry stole a pair of his teacher's high-heeled shoes and hid them in the classroom. Another student saw Jerry do this and told the teacher, and Jerry admitted to what he had done, immediately running out of the classroom once confessing. A few years later, while in his adolescence, his family once again packed up and moved to Oregon. To Jerry's delight, they just so happened to have moved into a house that was next door to a house full of girls, all daughters. Jerry would more than occasionally steal their undergarments that were hanging outside on the clothesline. Sometimes in broad daylight, he was getting more brave. He would wear the undergarments with enjoyment. This was the start of what would become an unthinkable nightmare to some innocent victims. Brudos suffered from extreme migraines and depression. He claimed later on that stealing garments and underwear helped quell the headaches and depression, if only for a short time. He went so far as to enter one of the girl's rooms at night while she slept and steal her underwear. 
Soon though, the clothing wasn't having the same effect as it used to. Jerry decided that taking actual pictures of women would be the next, quote, suitable step. Before we get too far into this story, it's worth mentioning that Brutos had already served some time years before the murder started. At age 17, he attacked two girls and landed in a psych unit to be treated for his sexual deviation. On one occasion when he was younger, he dug a small tunnel on a hillside with the intent to kidnap a girl and keep her as a slave inside the tunnel. But this plan, for one reason or another, never came to fruition. Thank God. As for the sexual assaults in his teenage years, Jerry was able to convince a young lady that he was working with the police and that he wanted to talk to her about the recent mass stealing of undergarments, which she did not know he was the one who's been stealing. He coaxed the young lady into his house under the impression that he was going to get her stolen items back. She reluctantly followed Brutos into the house. While there, he excused himself for a moment, leaving the girl by herself. A couple of minutes later, Brutos jumped out wearing a ski mask and brandishing a knife, insisting the girl take her clothes off or he would stab her. She complied, and Brutos, pretending to be someone else, started taking nude photos of her, forcing her to pose in different positions. When he was done, he ran out of the house. Jerry then emerged from the back door acting like he had no idea who this stranger was. Asking if she was alright and claiming the masked man locked Brutos in a shed out back and he just escaped. She didn't buy the story and she left immediately. She let it go for a while out of fear of being killed and I can't say I blame her. About 8 months later he offered a 17 year old girl a ride but instead of taking her to her destination he drove her to a deserted field and beat her up hitting her in the face so hard he broke her nose. This time, cops got a hold of Brutos. He readily admitted to beating the girl, seeming remorseful and not sure why he did it. He was committed to the Oregon State Hospital for evaluation, which also prompted a search of his house, where they found the forced nude pictures of the young neighbor girl. Brutos was 17 years old at the time. These are not the only instances that took place during this time. Brutos has said himself that he would occasionally find a young woman, stalk her, strangle her into unconsciousness, and then run off with her shoes, leaving the victim alive. He was held in the hospital for a total of nine months, then released. Doctors were saying that, although odd, his behavior was something Jerry would eventually, quote, grow out of, and that he was not dangerous. After a short stint in the military, Bruto was discharged for his erratic behavior and his, quote, odd obsessions. He was sent home to live with his mother again. Depressed about the military discharge and upset with his living situation, Brutus's migraines became worse. Stealing clothes and shoes and even rendering victims unconscious were doing very little in the way of helping these headaches anymore. And this is where the trouble turns deadly. Jerry Brutus has now made a life with a young lady named Darcy, marrying her and eventually having two children. At first things were generally pretty normal, but it wasn't very long before Darcy started noticing strange behavior. Brutos would make bizarre requests, like they should both walk around the house fully nude whenever possible, and that she was to wear high-heeled shoes at all times. He would make her pose for nude pictures that Brutos would take out and develop in his own personal darkroom. This continued, and after a while, Darcy began to pull away from Jerry. She didn't leave him, but started treating him a little more coldly. This caused some deep depression in Jerry, and his migraines got worse. On January 26, 1968, just days before Jerry's 30th birthday, he was out doing some yard work when a young, pretty 19-year-old girl selling encyclopedias in the neighborhood caught his eye. Although it wasn't the young girl herself that caught Brutos' attention, but the black, high-heeled shoes she was wearing. She seemed lost, but she was looking for a particular house. Brutos called her over, expressing interest in purchasing some encyclopedias from her. Jerry made the young lady feel comfortable with some small talk, then led her into the basement of his house where they could discuss the product she was selling. Once inside, Linda turned her back on Brutos to unpack the display she would be showing him, only to be violently struck in the head from behind with a 2x4, causing her to fall unconscious immediately. Jerry Brutos then proceeded to strangle Linda Slauson to death in his basement, all while his mother, wife, and children were directly upstairs from them. After the murder, Jerry went upstairs to his mother and sent her and their child and his wife out to get some fast food. Once they were gone, Brutus went back to Linda's body and proceeded to undress her, stealing her bra and underwear and eventually cutting off her left foot to model shoes with. He played with the corpse like a child plays with a doll, undressing and redressing her. He was upset at himself for not having a camera handy to take pictures of his work and swore that from now on he would. 
It's also worth mentioning that while he was, quote, playing with the dead victim, a friend of his came by to visit and Jerry had to think on his feet on how to get rid of him. Telling his friend that he was doing a dangerous experiment in the basement with nitroglycerine, effectively scaring him off. Happy with the way everything turned out, Brutus placed the severed foot into a freezer, tied a heavy engine head to the body, waited for his family to fall asleep, and at 2 a.m. dumped the body of Linda K. Slauson into the Willamette River in Portland. The weight of the engine head tied to her body pulled her under, and Brutus watched as she sank and disappeared. Her body was never found. Jan Whitney was only 23 years old when she was abducted and murdered by Jerry Brutus. It was around Thanksgiving time in 1968 when Jan Whitney was driving down the I-5 towards her home, but somewhere along the way, her car broke down on the shoulder of the freeway. Brutus saw her on the way home from his job, and he stopped to offer help. Brutus has said that she wasn't alone when he picked her up, that she was with two guys, both, quote, hippies. They all got into Brutus's car, and Jerry soon dropped off the two young men so they could continue thumbing rides in the direction they wanted to go. Brutus suspects that Jan may have picked up the boys first before her car broke down, because they went on their way separately while Jan stayed behind with Brutus, who had told her that he had tools at his house that they could go grab and he would bring her back and fix her car for her. Once they arrived at Brutus' house, Jan waited outside while Jerry went into the house to get the tools. Only he never did get any tools. He came back to the car and claimed he was locked out of his house and his wife would be home any minute and they could get the tools then. Except when Brutus got back into the car, it wasn't in the driver's seat. He got in the back seat directly behind Jan. He then used a leather strap to strangle her, looping it around her neck and closing the other end of the strap in the back door behind her, making it impossible for her to free herself. He left the car while Jan Whitney slowly died of asphyxiation. After a few minutes, he returned to the car and had sexual relations with her dead corpse, officially graduating to necrophilia. He then took her body into his garage and suspended it into the air with a hook and pulley, leaving her hanging there while he hooked a tow bar up to his car and headed back to the broken down vehicle to tow away the evidence. Brutus has said that his intention was to get rid of the car completely, but as he was driving down the road towing the car of the girl he had just murdered, he passed at least three police vehicles. This spooked Brutus, and rather than risking getting caught with the car, he pulled off and abandoned it in a parking lot. He returned home to the body, still hanging in the garage, and had intercourse with it once again. He spent a good amount of time playing with the now lifeless Jan Whitney, just as he had with the corpse of Linda Slauson, dressing her in different types of clothes and a silk nightgown, while having sexual relations with the body every so often. On Thanksgiving weekend, the Brutus family left town and would be gone for a couple of days. Before they left, Jerry made sure that the garage was locked up tight, leaving the body of Jan Whitney hanging from the hook inside. This move nearly got Jerry Brutos caught. While his family was away for the weekend, a car driving past the Brutos house lost control and wrecked into the side of the garage, leaving a hole in the wall. When police came to check out the scene, they could not get into the garage to assess the damage because it was locked up tight. Had one of the responding officers simply shown their flashlight through the hole from the outside, there very well may have discovered Jan's body, hanging from a hook and decomposing. However, no one looked inside the garage and instead left a card asking Jerry to contact them when he gets home. When the Brudoses arrived back home, Jerry immediately saw the damage to the garage and also found the card left by the officers. Walking inside the garage, Jerry was able to breathe a sigh of relief. Jan's body still hung there, unnoticed. Jerry took the body down from the hook and hid her in the pump house away from the garage. He then called the officer that left his card, and he came and left without incident. This was too close a call for Jerry, and after the cops left, Brutus went back to the pump house where Jan's body was lying, assaulted it one more time, cut off one of her breasts, and by tying some scrap metal to her, disposed of her body in the same way and in the same river as Linda Case Lawson. It was revealed later that the reason Brutus removed her breast was so he could make a paperweight from it. Brutus has said himself that he skinned, shaped, and plastered the severed breast, but it didn't turn out the way he wanted. Her body was found in the Willamette River on July 27, 1969. Karen Ellen Sprinker was only 19 years old when she left her home on March 27, 1969 to meet up with her mother in a department store for lunch and some shopping. It was spring break and Karen's mother was going to help her out with some new school clothes. Only Karen never showed. 
After waiting for close to an hour, Karen's mother left the restaurant, asking the host up front to please have Karen call her at home when she shows up. Karen never called. Though I couldn't nail down whether or not this next part is factual, some sources say that they witnessed a large man wandering around the parking garage dressed like a woman, and some believe that Brutos was dressed in drag when he abducted Karen. Karen Sprinker had parked on the roof parking section of the building. As she made her way through the parking garage and down a few steps to the entrance, she was suddenly grabbed by the shoulder. She spun around, startled, only to see a man with a gun pointed at her. Brutos threatened her, saying, If you don't scream, you won't get hurt. If you come with me, you won't get hurt. Karen, unfortunately, complied. Brutos took her back to his home and sexually assaulted her on the floor of his garage, stealing from her her virginity that she had so proudly held on to. After the sexual assault, Brutos made Karen pose for photos. Photos in her own clothes, photos in underwear from Jerry's collection, and photos of her completely nude. He also took photos of her wearing a black silk slip that was in his collection, as well as a pair of black high-heeled shoes. After the photo shoot, Brutos tied Karen's hands behind her back. He then wrapped a rope around her throat and, using a hand-operated winch, lifted her into the air by her neck. Karen kicked and fought, then died. Here are some of the pictures of Karen Sprinker that were snapped by Jerry Brutos. I don't know about you, but I can see the fear in her eyes. After killing her, Jerry had intercourse with her dead body, but not before he went inside to sit and visit with his family for a while. He then came back out to the body and removed both of her breasts. He then dressed her back up in her own clothes and took post-mortem photographs, stuffing the bra with paper towels to replace the breasts that Brutos had removed. He removed her breasts to again try to make molded paperweights from them. He has been quoted saying, I couldn't get the percentage of Hardner right this time but they still turned out better than with the girl from the freeway. He then waited for his family to go to sleep. At 2 a.m., Jerry Brudos threw Karen Sprinker's body into the Long Tom River, weighted down with another heavy car part, where he watched another one of his victims slowly disappear under the water. Brudos has stated himself that it wasn't even Karen Sprinker he was after that day, that he had lost his intentional target and picked Karen last minute. The body of Karen Sprinker was found May 12, 1969. Sometime in April, Brutos had attempted two failed abductions. In one instance, he tried abducting a young girl in her 20s by threatening her with a fake pistol that looked real. He was leading her back to his car when she spotted someone working in their yard. She took the opportunity to quickly run in this person's direction yelling for help. Jerry quickly hopped in his car and drove away. In another instance, he approached a woman named Sharon Wood using the same fake pistol but she successfully fought him off, kicking and screaming and twisting the gun around in his hand so violently that she almost broke his finger. With her screaming so loud in the parking garage, Brutos attempted to stifle her by covering her mouth. She bit down on his hand so hard that she made him bleed. This enraged Brutos. He twisted her hair up in his hand, forcing her to the concrete and smacked her head into the ground, nearly knocking her out, stunning her to the point where he could easily take her now. But then, a car rounded the corner and saved her life. Brutos ran off and the car stopped to help the battered Sharon. They called the police and Sharon gave a statement. Sharon Wood had survived a full-fledged encounter with a violent serial killer. She fought, she screamed, she kicked, she bit, and she won. But on the other hand, this encounter made Jerry realize he needed to reevaluate his M.O. and be more careful. And unfortunately, his next victim wouldn't be so lucky. Linda Saley was a 22-year-old secretary. She was very athletic and spent a lot of time with her boyfriend at the gym and at the swimming pool where her boyfriend worked as a lifeguard. One afternoon, Linda went to a local shopping mall to buy her boyfriend some gifts for his birthday. After she was finished shopping, as she was walking back to her car, Jerry Brutus approached her, flashing a police badge. He told Linda Saley that she was suspected of shoplifting and that she must come with him. Other than some timid denial, Linda went freely with him, saying almost nothing as he drove back to his house, a drive that took over an hour. Brutos has been noted as saying, quote, it was almost like she wanted to go with me, end quote. As stated before, Linda's boyfriend was a lifeguard at a local swimming pool. Linda would show up on a regular basis to swim laps while he worked. He was expecting her to show up on the Wednesday she was abducted. This worried her boyfriend instantly when she never showed. And then when she didn't show up to her job the next day, the police were called. 
Considering the amount of missing women lately, law officials took Linda's disappearance very seriously and immediately launched an investigation. When Brutus and Linda arrived at Jerry's house, he pulled the car up into the garage. He was unaware that his wife was at home at the time. Darcy walked out onto the porch to tell her husband that dinner was ready. During this conversation, Jerry had Linda right next to him, but Darcy could only see Jerry as he had his head sticking out of the doorway, and behind him his hand held up to stop Linda in her tracks so she wouldn't be seen. It's hard to imagine that at this point, Linda wasn't feeling a sense that something was terribly wrong. After Darcy returned to the house, Brutos tied Linda Saley up with a rope and left her in the garage while he went into dinner with his family. During this time, Linda was actually able to free herself. Jerry came back out to the garage and saw her sitting there, free from her binds. She did not try to escape, and there was a phone in the garage as well that she did not try to use. There are a couple of theories on this. Some say that it was likely a state of shock and trauma that kept her from running once she was free. Another theory, and one that I personally happen to think is more likely, is that she had freed herself just in time for Brutos to come walking back into the garage, stopping her from moving forward with her escape. She began to fight Brutos, and he struggled pretty badly with her. Brutos then wrapped a strap around Linda's throat, the same strap he used to murder Jan Whitney. He claims he lifted Linda off the ground by the strap while she asked, Why are you doing this to me? He strangled Linda Saley, sexually assaulting her body just as she died. After the murder, he hung her body from the ceiling like the others, only this time he was to take his sick depravity one step further. Brutos wanted to see if he could make the corpse, quote, dance. He took two hypodermic needles and stuck them on each side of her rib cage. He then attached electric leads to each needle and plugged it into the wall, hoping for some post-mortem movement. He was disappointed. All it did was burn her, leaving small holes surrounded by obvious burn marks that would baffle police upon examining her body when it was found. It wasn't until Jerry Brutos' confession that they found out the source of these marks. He kept her body in his garage for a full 24 hours, sexually assaulting it in the meantime. Jerry has been quoted complaining that he didn't care for Linda Saley at all, from her fighting him when he told her to stop to the way her nude body looked. He didn't remove Linda's breasts for this very reason. He wasn't impressed with their appearance, but he did still try to make molds of them using circular cups and epoxy. Again, the molds did not turn out how he wanted them. The next night, he used another heavy part from an automobile, drove her out to the Long Tom River, and disposed of her body. The body of Linda Dawn Saley was found May 10th, 1969. Linda Saley would be the last of Jerry Brutus's victims. May 10th, 1969. Sam Wallace was a fisherman who enjoyed going to the Long Tom River and finding good spots to maybe catch a couple fish and relax. But today, he would get a lot more than he bargained for. While looking for a spot to fish, Wallace found what he recognized as a dead human's hand sticking up from the water. When police arrived, they pulled the body of Linda Saley from the water. It was not an easy task as she was weighted down with a very heavy car part. And then, on May 12th, they found the body of Karen Sprinker, only a few feet away from where they found Linda Saley. Investigator Jim Stovall has been on the case and takes note of the way the ropes on the bodies were tied as the knots were of an unusual sort. Also attached to the bodies were some copper wiring to hold the weights down. It was noted that the same way the wire was twisted and cut was done in the same fashion that a skilled electrician would have done it. Jerry Brutos was a skilled electrician. But at this time, they didn't have a whole lot to go on other than these small discoveries. Meanwhile, strange phone calls start happening in the dorms of Oregon State University. A man had started calling and asking for random students, telling him that he was a lonely Vietnam veteran just looking for someone to go out with and discuss some of his ideas. When some students claimed they had to study, he claimed one of those ideas was a new studying technique he had learned while returning from war. Most girls turned him down. But somehow, he was able to persuade a young girl who agreed to meet with him. It didn't go well. She made it through the night unharmed, luckily, but Brutos had effectively creeped her out by asking her strange questions, including telling her to, quote, think of something really sad, like those girls who were murdered and thrown into the river. Just think about how sad that is, a horrible thing that happened. And also something to the effect of, quote, How do you know I won't strangle you and throw you into the river? He then mentioned something about needing to fix the engine in his car. This sparked her memory that the missing girls have all been weighed down with engine parts. 
She went home and contacted the authorities about the encounter, as by now the girls gone missing, one from her very school, were all very well known. The police then asked the young woman for a favor. They asked that she agree to meet with him again if he calls back. Willing to help catch this guy, she readily agreed, and he did call back. A few days later, the woman agreed to meet up with Brutos for another date, only when he showed up, it wasn't the woman waiting for him, but the police. They immediately detained Brutos and started questioning him. This first round of questioning was rather quick. BJ Miller and Frenchie Delamere were the officers to question him this first time, asking him his name, where he was from, etc. Jerry was very calm and showed no signs of being startled or nervous about this sudden line of questioning. So after a short conversation, they left and found Jerry's car, wrote down the license plate number, and did a background check on him. That is where everything started to come to the surface. The sexual crimes in his teenage years, the vicinity of where he lived according to where the girls were abducted, his route home from work aligning perfectly with where Jan Whitney broke down on the freeway. Detective Jerry Frazier arrived on the steps of Brutus' home to ask him some follow-up questions. Brutus led him to the garage, and there is where they talked. During their conversation, Frazier noticed a piece of nylon rope hanging in Brutus' garage. He studied it for a moment, only to have Brutus say to him, You seem to be interested in that knot. Go ahead and take it if you want to. Frazier happily complied and cut the rope with the knot. This was the undoing of Jerry Brutus. With the rope they had retrieved and all the evidence pointing to Jerry, law enforcement was able to secure a search warrant for the Brutus' home and garage. While conducting their search, police found pictures of the victims in various outfits, nude, and some photos looked like the victim was deceased. And one picture in particular was especially damning. The one picture that captured Jerry Brutos without a doubt. A picture of a young woman hanging from the ceiling with the camera focused on a mirror that was lying on the ground. The mirror was angled so the reflection showed up the slip the girl was wearing, aimed at her crotch. But what Jerry didn't know was that a clear reflection of his face in the mirror showed up on the photograph. So now they had physical evidence of Jerry Brutos taking pictures of a dead woman in his garage. That was the end of Jerry Brutos' reign of terror. One of the surviving victims was able to pick Jerry Brutos from a lineup, and they had a photo of Jerry with the deceased woman hanging from the ceiling above him. On June 2nd, 1969, Jerry Brutos was arrested and charged with four counts of murder. He was convicted of three and given three life sentences. Unfortunately, the body of Linda K. Slauson was never found, therefore Jerry was not convicted of her murder and that charge was in fact dropped due to lack of evidence. Jerry Bruto spent the rest of his life in prison. He died there on March 28, 2006 from liver cancer. He was the longest surviving inmate at the Oregon Department of Corrections, having served 37 years. Jerry's wife, Darcy Brutos, was also charged for aiding and abetting, but was acquitted on all charges. She has since moved away, changed her name, and got a legal order so that her kids were never allowed to contact their father again while he was still alive. It would take another two to three hours to go through every detail of the story, and there's plenty more to learn about this monster. For the best information on Jerry Brutos, I, rec I recommend you read Anne Rule's The Lust Killer, a detailed account of this horrible year in history. Jerry Brutos is only one example of this type of monster, and there are plenty more examples. All you have to do is subscribe to this channel, turn on the notifications so you know when the next video is available, and again we'll discuss the worst of the worst. Thank you for joining me today, stay safe, and I'll see you next time on Lesser Known Monsters.